Welcome to another episode of the Jay and Rob Toy Show, and this is going to be a defining episode, if there ever was one, but I can't do it all by myself. Let me bring in my collaborator, my brother, my co-host, the Lady J, to my Flint, Mr. Jay Bartlett. <laughs> what? Lady J, really? Oh, I guess, ah, oh, Jay. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go, see, it's a tandem. We're a team, we do things together. Lady J's pretty cool, I wouldn't be knocking her. Oh, I'm not knocking her. I was just kind of trying to figure out where you're going, and I figured it out. Well, there we go. And if you're ready to talk toys, which I'm guessing you are since you're here filming with us, we can dive right in. I haven't stopped talking toys. Let's get to it. Well, today is a pretty monumental episode. We are going to try to do the thing that nobody has done ever, and this time it's gonna stick. We are gonna determine the best of the best and it's gonna be cemented in history. And what I mean by that, Jay, is we're gonna go through various categories to determine who is the master of each category when it comes to the world of action films. Well, this is an exciting one. Um, almost like a great debate. Let's start it off with figure design. Of all the action figures out there that have ever existed and ever come, what figure line has the best design and why? The best designed figure of all time is G.I. Joe, 1982 to 1994, hands down. Why? The articulation, first and foremost, the ability to be able to repair the figure, which back then you had to be a super scientist, but today it's pretty common practice, you know, taking up the screw and all. So if you had broken parts on your Joe, you could go find another one, Unscrew the back, make those repairs. Uh, all you need is those little washers. They're called O-rings. I love G.I. Joe. I love the way that you can pose the figures from a real American hero. I love that the scale is 3.75, so you can have a pile of Joe figures and have a massive battle, or you can put them all outside and just in a tree or a couple rocks, and it feels like it's a real kind of, yeah. you know, a battle scene that's about to take place. It just feels real, and it works. However, I don't think that it's the best design figure out there. The fact that it can break and there's this whole inherent you're able to repair it scheme is a bit of a knock. I'm glad that there's an easy solution. Well, hang on, hang on. But I don't think it's the best figure design uh, Hang out on, there. I wouldn't call it a scheme. Uh, it's something that definitely was not intended to happen. Uh, these were disposable toys. We weren't supposed to go in there and fix them, right? They were just, they broke, you threw them away kind of thing. So I wouldn't call it a scheme, my friend, but nice try. I see where you're going with this. I would like to say that I think maybe TMNT has some of the best designed figures out there. Now TMNT, the look of the entire line is super unique. There is not the same buck over and over and over again. Even within the turtles, they look different and they use different you know, tints of green to help separate them on top of their mass bandanas, of course. But they're a good meaty figure. They, they hold in your hand and yet you can still pose them really Really well they have tons of accessories that add to the playtime and you can have a lot of battles with all these colorful characters and they actually interact pretty well with all the vehicles that are there too so they didn't get to skimp out on anything like that and because that figure is the heart of that line those characters they they really truly stand up to the test of time and uh, you don't get a lot of broken Ninja Turtles out there they they stand the test of a good playtime session well, I challenge you, if you think turtles don't break easily, I challenge you to find a vintage Michelangelo with a nunchuck still intact. <laughs> Good luck with that. Well, I don't disagree with you that they're durable, because they absolutely are. It's pretty difficult to break a turtle figure. Their pre-posed poses uh, were a problem for me. Whereas G.I. Joe, you can stand them at attention, you can stand them battle ready, you can make them hunched over in pain if they've been injured in battle. Turtles are always like this. Oh. They're always like this, uh, similar to He-Man. Their legs are spread apart, uh, they don't bend at the knees or the elbows. I mean, it kind of limits you. The, the newer stuff, of course, the NECA stuff is great, where you can kind of do whatever you want, but 
the pre-posed posing it was an issue for me for turtles. Well, I'm sorry that they didn't come with the stand that you needed to get your guy to stand up. And that's, of course, before the legs went all floppy woppily. And they could even stand because after a few playtime sessions with the Joe, they had the loose legs where they're just drifting in the wind like a weekend at Bernie's. They're just sitting there <laughs> flopping around. And then they were in pain the whole time because they couldn't be part of the battle. Their legs weren't good enough and you had to go buy another one or rely again on the little scheme to have a stand because they knew they couldn't stand up on their own. So look, uh, I'm afraid Real American Hero doesn't work. I don't know who you're playing with or what they're doing to these poor figures, but uh, I certainly didn't have that problem myself. A few friends that we both know um, were a little harder on the toys, but you and I weren't so much, so I personally didn't have that problem with Joe's. Weak argument, my friend. Weak argument. So switching gears, let's talk about figure options. Which characters out there from lines that we've gotten are the most unique, the most uh, interesting options we got? You know, Real American Hero, they all kind of look the same. Is that a lot of figure options? Sure, there's quantity, but what kind of variation are we getting in there? So think, Jay, of all the action figure lines, which is the most interesting set of characters that we got? The most interesting set, I would say, would be LJN's Thundercats. Now hear me out. Now it's not my favorite line to collect, uh, not even my favorite line to look at, but if you look at each individual figure, every single mold is completely different. We're masters of the universe, more or less, even G.I. Joe, shared the same kind of structure. And Thundercats were just so diverse. They're bigger characters, smaller. Some of them had no articulation, like Wily Kit and Wily Cat. Uh, lion -O is completely different than Mumra. Panther is completely different from Jackal Man. It's a, it's a good call. Thundercats is certainly unique from one another, and yet they all fit together to be part of the whole, which makes my suggestion seem weird. But for the sake of different character options, I think it's impossible to beat. I think my answer is the best, Jay. And that is the answer of Transformers. Because every character just works so well on its own. You got Optimus Prime in robot mode, and he's awesome like that, and he's awesome when you transform him. You go through the line of all the characters, even into G2, and even if you want to get into the Beast Wars stuff, they're all so diverse, and yet they all have the inherent design of transforming. That's all they have to do. That's the goal. As long as they can transform into a robot, either into an animal or to a vehicle, sure. then they have succeeded. And I think you don't get more figure options than than Transformers because it wasn't like only six figures got released. You know, there yeah. was a lot of Transformers that we there saw. There is. G1 had a significant amount. The problem is, my friend, uh, you're completely incorrect. Uh, you want to buy Starscream, that's fantastic. Uh, but then you get Skywarp and Thundercracker also released in, in uh, the first line. It's literally the exact same mold. Cliff Jumper, Bumblebee, the same mold. Optimus Prime and the innards of Ultra Magnus. You see where I'm going with this. Uh, so typical Hasbro, uh, they construct one mold uh, that's very fantastic and they just uh, repaint it. Which again, we've talked about this, it doesn't bother me, but for the sake of this debate, I will say you're completely incorrect in saying Transformers. Well, I'm gonna disagree with your disagreeing because even with those knockoffs, the fact that you essentially get two forms to every single character that is unique, therefore, it overwrites your rule and your argument. <laughs> so I'm wrong again? Zero for two right here. Wrong again. Zero for two. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about our favorite thing to discuss, and that's playsets. Yeah. There are a lot of playsets in action figure history. Which lines did playsets the best and why? Oh, man, these questions. I'm glad you don't feed them to me ahead of time. Um, the greatest playsets of all time have to be Masters of the Universe and G.I. Joe. They have to be. Let's start with Masters, and I know I have to pick one of the two, but I'm going to kind of talk myself through this here. Masters of the Universe. Sure, I'll sit back. Sure. I'll sit back and pick the other one and then tell you that you're wrong. I'll debate the myself here. Um, Masters of the Universe okay. have probably the most iconic playsets in toy history. Of course, Castle Grayskull being the center of this. There's so many play features. It doubles as a carrying case. Uh, the scale of the thing, it, it's ginormous for five inch figures and it's lightweight so it can be carried easily by, by kids. G.I. Joe, oh wow. G.I. Joe have play sets 
uh, that range from mini all the way up to gigantic like the flag and the pterodrome. So you really win that way as a parent because if you can't afford you know, the giant USS flag from 1985. You can still get these really cool bunkers, the checkpoints and stuff like that. And I remember having a ton of those and they are still fantastic. Out of the two, since you're gonna pick the other one, I'm gonna go with G.I. Joe as having the greatest play sets of all time. I'm actually gonna go with Star Wars, Kenner. Star Wars, because I think the Death Star is a fantastic playset. I think the Cantina is a fantastic playset. I think uh, Dagobah is a fantastic playset. The Hoth base is also fun. And these aren't huge, but they're little pieces of the world that you can get and have it all a part of thing. And I would also say the Millennium Falcon in and of itself is a playset because you can take off the top and have all the characters enjoy the environment and hang out in the back. And I think that is a true testament to a, a multi-purpose environment where it can both be a vehicle and a play space as well. So yeah, 100%, I think Star Wars did it best. And without Star Wars doing what they did, I don't think G.I. Joe could have done what they did. I'm Nate Barch and I'm a toy designer slash packaging designer slash illustrator. I work primarily with the Four Horsemen um, and I, I love toys. Nate Barch has made a name for himself as an incredible fantasy toy designer and illustrator thanks to collaborations with the industry's biggest names, including Mattel, Four Horsemen Toy Design, Super 7, NECA, and many more. I think packaging has to introduce you to the world of whatever that action figure is selling. In my opinion, some of the best examples were the Masters of the Universe packaging in the 80s, where when I was a kid in the store and I saw that Castle Grayskull, I, I needed to be in that world. And it was, that was the packaging. That was all Rudy Obrero. I mean, that's, it, it was the direction of the people working on the line. It's marketing for sure. It needs to grab your attention. I think play sets are absolutely necessary in any successful action figure line. I think if you don't have a play set, you're, you're missing an opportunity to further tell that action figure story. On the other hand, I can see a, an argument that could be made where if you don't have play sets, it forces people to get out there and get creative. Some of the earliest figures I remember getting were the Battlestar Galactica figures, 1977 Ben Kenobi and Darth Vader figures, Star Wars stuff. Yeah, is, when I was a child, times would get tough. You would disappear into the worlds that those action figures brought you. I had, of course, He-Man figures for my kids, my daughters. They would play with them a certain way. They would act out different scenarios that they would be thinking about. I think in a lot, in a lot of ways, those action figures become avatars of what it is that we're trying to process and learn as, as people. <laughs> I would have my daughter playing with He-Man and Skeletor, and they were friends going to the store or whatever, which is not a play pattern, I'm sure, that was intended for those figures, but that's how she played with them. Whereas with me as a kid, I was imagining all kinds of different adventures. I was trying to, maybe the avatars I was trying to create was what is the future gonna be? Especially like with Star Wars and, and He-Man where they dealt with a lot of future scenarios of different technologies and, and get our minds working on what those technologies could become and what those, what those patterns may be, I guess, I don't know. We live in a day and age now where it's not frowned upon anymore as a grown up. To, to buy toys for yourself. Just embrace it and go with it. You still will find people that'll make fun of you or whatever, but I, we're in 2019 now, and I think we're all as a society learning that if you're bagging on somebody for getting into something that they love, then you're the piece of crap, you know what I mean? So it's let people be what they wanna be and let them enjoy what they wanna enjoy. We all grew up in that prime era of 80s toys, so we enjoy toys. It's been interesting to see of how, how much emphasis adults, I think, have put on into designing action figures, where it was, I think in the beginning, a lot of it was like, look, I wanna give my kid a thing. This is what we're into and what I think my kids should be into. And so they would build it for them for that day. We live in a time now where that's totally flipped. I mean, we, we're adults that grew up with action figures and we wanna design stuff the way we wanted it as a kid. So articulation goes up paint goes up, attention to detail in the sculpts go way up, and, and we're building things that aren't to be played with for a little bit and thrown away, but we're building things that we want to have stay with people and mean something to people for a long time. 
I know whenever I approach a design, it's, it's the same thing. I've got to put my heart into it. I've got to believe in whatever it is that I'm trying to sell. But also, there's a part of me that wants to revert back to as a kid, and it's because I, I trust my inner child to say, this is what I would have wanted, and I'm just going to go with what that is. As an adult, you've got to think around a lot of other problems, but at the heart of it, it's got to come from what's going to speak to that inner child, I think. I think the future of action figures will be, I think things will be pushed even further. Realism may be pushed further, um, or it may pull back and go into more of an artistic expression. Much like any art form today of different paintings, you have people that can do photorealistic, amazing, pieces of artwork, or you have somebody that's just trying to represent a feeling, and they can do that with just a few brush strokes and a simplified design. So I think more focus will go on those designs. Vehicles. Which, uh, which action figure lines do vehicles the best? I know G.I. Joe is an obvious answer here, but is yeah. it the right answer? Um, it would be the right answer. I'm gonna switch things up a bit and I'm going to discuss Kenner's mask, which I think have the most gorgeous looking vehicles in toy history. Uh, they're a lot smaller than the 3.75 inch, but it would be pretty hard pressed for you to find a more gorgeous vehicle than Mask's Rhino. They have so many different functions, they transform, uh, they fit so space is never an issue, so you know you can fill your shelves with them and they come with those little figures with removable accessories. Later on, we got weapon packs for the mask figures. Mask all the way. I'm dying to know. I'm dying to know how you're gonna argue this one. Let's hear it. Well, I'm simply just gonna say Transformers. It is a vehicle line. Every character yeah. is a vehicle. No, no thanks. How can you <laughs> argue with that? Uh, they're... <laughs> You know what, they, they both have something very much in common and they're both extremely fragile. And I think Transformers are just a little bit more fragile having the early stuff at least, the combination of metal and plastic. Mask is also very fragile. As we know, there's a lot of tiny parts. Uh, the chrome wears out very easily. And then of course we have the replica Goodyear tires which dry rot. If they're not stored properly, uh, they rot and split. And good luck replacing that stuff. It's time for Action Figure Spotlight, and it's your favorite time of the show, it's my favorite time of the show, and this could be anything, because we're talking about lines and different features and what makes them stand apart. So of course, I'm gonna do my curveball kind of at the beginning, and I'm gonna showcase a figure that kind of ended my, my childhood playtime, and that is Dick Tracy from Playmates. Uh, 1990 release, and it's not that this figure specifically ended my playtime, but this was the third or fourth wave of figures um, that I started collecting as a kid. Of course, there's Masters that I was into, Ghostbusters and Turtles, a little bit of Captain Power. But by the time Dick Tracy came around in the early 90s, uh, and I was picking up the figures, and of course, excited for the movie, especially on the heels of 89 Batman, and it looked so similar. That's what it really started to set in of, you know, is playtime over? Am I getting to an age where I am not really getting enough. Or is it the figure? Is the figure not, you know, offering enough? I remember after getting these figures in particular, I would still get a few Ninja Turtles here and there. But this line coming out, it, that's when it felt like, okay, here's the next thing I had to get. Here's the next train that I had to get on in terms of uh, hype or play or got to get those toys too. And it and it was easily a 90 degree turn in, in my evolution as, as, a, as a kid. But, you know, Dick Tracy, the titular hero, I don't know why he never came with his yellow trench coat, even as an add-on or even just as a plastic uh, bit. The blank has a black trench coat. Surely they could have molded uh, the same thing for Tracy here in yellow. Um, it's from 1990, like I said. Card art borrows a little bit from G.I. Joe with the file cards here. You get the cross cell down here with the actual figures. You get a little bit of the scene, which I think is nice. They kind of really set it up as the 1930s comic. Uh, inspired character. Uh, not much to the figure itself. It's pretty uh, limited, a lot like the Star Trek The Next Generation figures from Playmates. Uh, just a kind of big piece of plastic with limited articulation. The accessories are almost all the same for all the figures, so there wasn't much imagination there. Uh, but this was kind of the, the first point about burnout, and I thought, this line is not as good as other stuff that I got. So, Dick Tracy from my spotlight. That's awesome, Rob. I don't think 
If memory serves me correctly, I don't think I had any Dick Tracy figures. I certainly remember you did, and I know that it's a line that I've wanted to start collecting, so I'm gonna have to look into that. So mine's kind of the opposite. This is a toy line that got me back into a line, and that, of course, is uh, Transformers. Now, in 2018, there was a little brand that came out called The War for Cybertron Siege. We didn't know at the time what it was. Of course, we'd find out later it was, you know, a trilogy of shows on Netflix. This is one of the most iconic characters, not only in Transformers, but in all of pop culture. This is, of course, Optimus Prime, the Earthrise version, meaning that this is the Earth truck form of Optimus Prime himself. Why do I love it? He's screen accurate, he's cartoon accurate, he looks exactly like he does. Uh, the weapon is great. Um, this line in particular, again, I love because they're all to scale with one another, save for Unicron and uh, the bigger bots like uh, Omega Supreme and stuff like that. But for the most part, they are to scale with each other, which we didn't get a lot of in the G1 stuff. I mean, it's Optimus Prime. He's durable, he's poseable, the articulation is fantastic. And um, Transformers, the ones that I collected, didn't have the greatest of articulation at the time. Like I said, I didn't get on board with the Masterpiece stuff. Uh, but as soon as I found these guys in stores, I fell in love with, and I have most of the Siege ones. They're all fantastic. The whole War for Cybertron line, I find really fascinating. And I almost liken it to Masters of the Universe classics because you have all these characters that are dead ringers for their media counterparts, and there's a uniform you know, approach to all these figures. And the textures that they use on them is what really sells me. It, it, you know, I know it's plastic, and I can feel that it's plastic, but there's a grittiness to it that makes it feel like it's a battle-worn metal. Uh, and yeah. just the design details, the intricate way that the, the joints are put together, like they're not hiding anything because it's a robot and you don't need to. So there's an authenticity there that I think comes to Transformers for the first time in a grounded way that I think the people that are only have a passing interest in something like Prime, like somebody like myself, never been into it, but I'd get a Prime and a Starscream because they look like that, which is close enough to the G1 show, but new enough that makes me feel like I'm getting something better. Yeah, exactly. And they're durable, which is also great. Um, of course, everyone remembers the G1 Optimus Prime and all the issues that he had. He looked fantastic, but after transforming him and playing with him after a while, you know, he had kind of that bad back where he fell down a lot of the time. You don't get that with this new stuff. Now, of course, you're not getting the metal. I'm fine with that. I don't really care that there's real metal on my Transformers. Um, but I love this figure. He's just, he's so cool. Well, that'll do it for another episode of the Jay and Rob Toy Show. Jay, big question for you. I mentioned with Dick Tracy, that's when I first noticed as a kid that I was getting a lesser kind of figure than I had before, and it led to some burnout and me changing how I wanted to have playtime. When did you first realize that you were collecting and playing with a line? It was a little bit of a lesser experience than some of the figures that you had before. And what was that line? That's a great question. Off the top of my head, I remember being severely disappointed with Battle Beasts. Although I do appreciate them more today as an adult collector, back then it relied very heavily on the gimmick, which was, you know, basically a paper, rock, scissor kind of thing. And once you knew what the Battle Beast had on his chest, there just wasn't a lot more to do with them. Uh, they did come with weapons and they were articulated, but they were just tiny. And I just remember there being so many of them. Uh, I just, I really got burnt out trying to chase these things and it really got annoying to be honest.